Shalom and welcome everyone. My name is Tony Pino and today I am going to be sharing with you on the pre-trip rapture. I'm going to be showing you that there is no such thing as a pre-trip rapture. All right, there's not found anywhere in the Hebrew scriptures. It's not found anywhere in the new covenant. It's only alluded to by certain passages, but nowhere in the Bible is there taught a pre-trib rapture, okay? Now, if you're sitting in a congregation that holds to a pre-trib rapture, I'm not saying everything that you're learning there is false, but this particular doctrine is false and you just need to be aware of it. Hundreds of thousands of believers of Messiah are waiting for this pre-trib rapture to happen where they'll be whisked away and not be a part of the tribulation period that comes in the future. They're gonna be off at the wedding feast and, and so forth. It's all false. Okay, you are the body of Messiah, right? You are the bride and the bride is Israel. And that is proven throughout the Hebrew scriptures that the covenant is made with the nation of Israel. And we Gentiles are grafted in, just like at Mount Sinai, where the betrothal actually began and took place. The father betrothed Yeshua to the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai. I believe in the deity of Yeshua. And I believe that the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit was there. All three were there. There was also Gentiles there who were being grafted into the nation of Israel. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 38, the mixed multitude left with them. And so they all became Israel at Mount Sinai, those who freely wanted to come in by grace, by faith. Amen. This is why throughout the Torah, you will see there's one Torah, both for the native and the foreigner who dwells with you. And as the body of Messiah, we all dwell together, no matter where we are. And so we are all part of Israel and we are all part of our covenants. Amen. Now, the first place that I want to go to, to help uh, show you that this foundation that I just shared with you is right there in scripture is Yermayahu, Jeremiah chapter 31. Amen. So here we are in Yermayahu, Jeremiah chapter 31. Verses 30 through 34 states, Behold, days are coming. It is a declaration of Yahweh when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. It is a declaration of Yahweh. So you can see that both the Sinai covenant and the new covenant are made with the house of Israel. That makes up the body of Messiah. Okay, one is a covenant of the flesh. They broke that one. Now that's one that is of the spirit, but it is still the nation of Israel. Okay, and if you are a Gentile, you are grafted in, which we will talk about, especially when we go to Romans chapter 11. Now, verse 32 states, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Notice that he's taking both kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, and becoming one again. Okay, the house of Israel is all 12 tribes. After those days, it is a declaration of Yahweh. I will put my Torah within them. Yes, I will write it on their heart. I will be their people and they will, uh, I will be their God and they will be my people. Verse 33, no longer will each teach his neighbor or each his brother saying, no Yahweh, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. It is a declaration of Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity, their sin I will remember no more. Thus says Yahweh, who gives the sun as a light by day and the fixed order of moon and the stars as a light by night, who stirs up the sea so it waves roar. Yahweh Zabaot is his name. So this totally destroys supersessionism, replacement theology, the idea that the people of Israel are not Israel, okay? not in covenant with Yahweh. No, he has forever bound himself to the nation of Israel. Yeshua has. He's going to fulfill his covenant promises. And we Gentiles, again, we are grafted in and become part of this nation of this covenant. So the idea that there is some distinct group called the church is nowhere found in the Bible. It's nowhere found in the Hebrew scriptures. There's no prophecy about it. It's nowhere mentioned about it. It is all made up when people read the New Covenant Scriptures, they infer it into certain passages, and this is what helps for them to infer this pre-trib rapture idea, because it's, it's taught nowhere plainly in Scripture anywhere. Now, as we move on to Ezekiel chapter 36, we can see that Yahweh is going to speak to the nation of Israel and tell them more about how he's going to be faithful to them. So verse 22 
Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says Yahweh Elohim, I do not do this for your sake, house of Israel, but for my holy name, which you profaned among the nations wherever you went. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them. The nations will know that I am Yahweh. It is a declaration of Yahweh when I am sanctified in you before their eyes. Okay, in case you have any doubts that the nation of Israel will not be sanctified in uh, the eyes of Yahweh. Here it is right here. He promises all 12 tribes will be sanctified. Okay, verse 24, for I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries and bring you back to your own land. Yeshua is going to do this when he returns. He's going to bring them all back. Amen. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the stony heart from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my ruach, my spirit within you. Then I will cause you to walk in my laws. So you will keep my rulings and do them. Okay. This is speaking to the nation of Israel and all those who are grafted in and a part of her. Okay. Then you will live in the land that I gave your fathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. Okay. So the nation of Israel will forever remain. And it is the bride of Messiah. Okay. Remember, Jeremiah says that he was a husband to them and he still is in the new covenant. So verse 29, so I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call the grain and make it plentiful. I will bring, I will not bring a famine upon you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field so that you will no longer bear the disgrace of famine among the nations when you remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. You will be disgusted with yourselves because of your iniquities, your abominations. For your sake will I, I'm sorry, not for your sake will I do this. It is a declaration of Yahweh. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confound for your ways, house of Israel. Okay, so they're going to wake up as a nation, they're going to wake up. We already have Israelites. We have Jews that have woken up that are ministering the gospel to their own people. Amen. And so we as Gentiles are ministering the gospel also, but the body of Messiah is within the nation of Israel and her covenants, not outside. Okay. We're going to be looking at this word church here real soon. And once we dismantle a lot of this, then the pre-trib rapture just easily goes away. Now, in Romans chapter 11, we see that in verse 11, now Paul is speaking of Israel, and he's basically saying, do not think that they have fallen away or been totally, you know, removed from Yahweh's eyes or his presence, that the covenant is no longer with them. He's actually correcting those who might be thinking that here in Romans. And he says in verse 11, I say then, they did not stumble as to fall, did they? May it never be. Okay, they meaning Israel. But by their false step, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy. Now, if their transgression leads to riches for the world and their loss riches for the Gentiles, then how much more their fullness, okay, when they come in. But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles insofar as I am an emissary to the Gentiles. I spotlight my ministry if somehow I might provoke to jealousy my own flesh and blood and save some of them. For if their rejection leads to reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Amen. They will be rebirthed. Just look at Ezekiel 37 with the dry bones. Okay. Yahweh will make them live again. Amen. He's already, there's a remnant out there already that is living for Yeshua. And so one day it'll be the whole nation. Now, verse 16, if the first fruit is holy, so is the whole batch of dough. If the remnant is holy, that is here today, the whole batch is holy, okay? That just means distinct and set apart. Doesn't mean they're saved. They still have to come in through Yeshua. You can only get saved by faith in Yeshua, okay? That's the only way you can come in, but they are holy. They are holy and distinct. All right, so uh, and if the root is holy, so are the branches, okay? The root is the covenants, Abraham, the Sinai covenant, all the covenants that is connected to Israel. But if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became a partaker of the root of the olive tree with its richness, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, it is not you who support the root, but the root supports you, okay? The natural olive tree is Israel. 
you've been grafted in as a Gentile. You're part of the body of Messiah, which is in Israel. Okay. The natural olive branches that are believers are in the natural tree. Wild olive branches are grafted in. Okay. The root is the covenants that belong to Israel. Verse 19, you will say then branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. True enough. They were broken off because of unbelief and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Notice then the kindness and severity of God, severity towards those who fell, but God's kindness towards you. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. Okay, this is what's going to happen at the end. You're going to see a lot of natural branches being grafted in when Yeshua returns. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of that by which nature is a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Okay, this is what the covenant is with. The covenants are with Israel. All right, they still have the patriarchs, the temple, the covenants, everything that Paul says in the book of Revelation. Now, as we move here forward, well, we could still read verse 25 and 26, for I do not want you brothers and sisters to be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own eyes. And this is what's happened with this pre-trib rapture stuff, that a partial hardening has come to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written, the deliverer shall come out of Zion. He shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is all 12 tribes. Okay. Israel makes up all 12 tribes. Yeshua will restore all 12 tribes. Okay. He is the lion of Judah. He is the king of Judah. Amen. And so, yes, all 12 tribes will be saved in the future because she is the bride. Okay. She is the bride. And just uh, spoiler alert, all you got to do is go to Revelation, the very end where it talks about new Jerusalem, which is what the capital of Israel is the bride coming out of heaven, okay? That great city, she's got 12 gates. 12 gates make up the 12 tribes. So yes, she is the bride, okay? And so this distinct separate group called the church, nowhere in the Bible. And then this means that the pre-trib rapture is false. Now let's move on. Ephesians chapter two. Starting with verse 11, therefore, keep in mind that once you Gentiles in the flesh were called uncircumcised by those called circumcision, which is performed on flesh by hand. At that time, you were separated from Messiah, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Yeshua. What covenant have you been brought into? the covenant that belongs to Israel, the new covenant, the Brit Hadashah, you've been grafted in. You are part of Israel, the commonwealth of Israel now, okay? And then we have Galatians 6.16. Now, as many as live by this rule, shalom and peace on them and on the Israel of God. The Israel of God is both Gentile and Israelites, right? All 12 tribes that have faith in Yeshua, faith in Yeshua, Okay, outside of faith in Yeshua, there is no salvation, but the promises are made to Israel and one day all of Israel will be saved. Okay, this doesn't mean that those who didn't have faith are part of that. Okay, just want to keep that clear also. All right, so the next area to easily prove that there is no such thing as a pre-trib rapture is looking at the word church. The word church is not ecclesia, but the Greek word kyriakon, okay? We have to see and understand that this word church was brought in by a man-made tradition later, okay, much, much later in to the word ecclesia. The word ecclesia just means assembly or congregation. All you got to do is look at the Hebrew scriptures. You will not see the word church in the Hebrew scriptures. Ecclesia is connected to kahal or Ada in the Hebrew scriptures, which is the congregation of Israel. And so when Yeshua came and talked about the Ecclesia, when all the Brit Hadashah, the new covenant authors talk about Ecclesia, they're talking about the assembly of Messiah, the body of Messiah, which is in Israel, 
understanding the covenants is something within it. But this church, this word church was invented by people who hold to replacement theology. They wanted to show something distinct and separate from Israel, that there are different people group, that basically Israel is no more. The covenants are no more with Israel. And that's really how this word really got its traction and its ground uh, when it was put in through the English here. Okay. All the manuscripts have ecclesia, which simply means congregation or assembly. It's a generic word, but in the context, it's talking about the body of Messiah and the body of Messiah is within Israel. Amen. All right. We can see the evidence of this when we can go to an early Anglo-Saxon word for church, kirkon, used in Bible translations as early as 1000 AD. The, Ang uh, the Anglo-Saxon Gospels from the Corpus Christi Manuscript 140, dating to about 1000 AD, and the Anglo-Saxon Gospel Hattan Manuscript 38, dating to about 1200 AD, bear witness to the early form of the English word church taken from the Hattan uh, manuscript 38, Matthew 16, my church and the gates of hell reads, my Kirkan and Hellgate. See, they changed the word Ecclesia. They used the Greek word Kyriakon, a form of it, because there is an agenda that is happening here. And so as far as 1000 AD, okay, which is what, a thousand years or so after, the resurrection of Messiah. They start incorporating the word church here. All right, the Tyndale Bible in about 1524 did not use the word church except in Acts 19.37 for uh, the heathen temples. It used the word congregation in all other places. Sometimes after this Bible, they started replacing the word congregation with the word church, especially when we get to the development of the King James Version. So the Coverdale Bible was produced in 1535, and he also translated the word Ecclesia as congregation, but was also familiar with the English word churches and used it. Four times in his translation, it is found in his English translation in Leviticus 26 through 31, also in Hosea 8.14, and also in Amos 7.9, okay, where it says uh, in Leviticus 26.31, and your cities will I make waste, okay, in Hosea 8.14, I mean, th this is very hard to believe, but you can see the word churches is used there, uh, and you can see it in Amos 7.9, can't even read <laughs> some of this uh, old English style here. But, you know, we're seeing it being slowly incorporating it into the English Bible here. So first, you have to have the false doctrine. That there's something separate and distinct uh, people group from Israel. Then you can start incorporating this word church into the word ecclesia and just replace it. You can see how it's a man-made tradition. Okay. And then later is going to come the pre-trip rapture. There is no such thing as a pre-trip rapture here because what? In the first century, if you are a believer in Messiah, whether Jew or Gentile, you are part of Israel. And now over time, you first got to separate the people and say, oh, no, there's this distinct separate people that is the new Israel. Okay, Israel's been done away with, you know, in 70 CE when the temple was destroyed. There are no more Yah's people, only the Gentile uh, group here that have faith in Yeshua, we're a distinct people, we're not Israel. And so they're making up, okay? They're taking a truth that the body of Messiah is made up of both Jews and Gentiles, but they're separating it from Israel and they're creating a falsehood here, all right? Which error begets error, begets error, begets error, and it continues. So there's much more to say about the word church. I do have a three-part teaching on my YouTube channel where I walk you through this and show you the development of the word church, but it is a man-made tradition. 
So if it's a man-made tradition, there goes the pre-trib rapture, it's gone. When you're using the proper language of assembly or congregation within the new covenant scriptures, everywhere where the word ecclesia is, just use congregation or uh, use assembly and you've got the correct interpretation, okay? The word church is going to be deceptive, okay? It's gonna be misleading at least because you're thinking a separate people group, all right? This is why you have this separate people group getting you know, raptured out of here before the tribulation starts. Even people who hold that Israel is still the people of Yahweh, because of this word church, they think there's this separate, distinct Gentile group called the church, which is found nowhere in the Hebrew scriptures, not prophesied, nothing. Okay. And so everything shows that we are in Israel, part of Israel. All right. So now let's move on to the next part where it talks about, you know, the wrath, how we're not supposed to suffer the wrath of Yahweh. So people will say, see, we're not supposed to go through the tribulation period because we're not supposed to suffer Yahweh's wrath. All right, so you can find uh, that passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, where Paul states, for we are not appointed to wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. Okay, this word wrath is orge in Greek. And it points towards what? It's pointing towards the lake of fire. It's pointing towards the final judgment. Notice you're appointed to salvation, not wrath, okay? This wrath is not the tribulation wrath. This wrath is pointing you towards the end times and pointing you towards the white throne judgment, okay? Even when you read the book of Revelation, just looking at uh, chapter 15, verse one, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And you have thumos there. That Greek word thumos is more dealing with a temporary wrath, okay? It's a temporary tribulation. It's an outpouring of Yahweh's wrath, but it will subside. It will cease, Whereas when we're talking about 1 Thessalonians 5, this wrath never ceases. This is an eternal wrath. We are spared the eternal wrath of Yahweh because we are obtaining salvation in Messiah. So no, you are not spared the tribulation wrath, okay? Just look at around the world at Christians who have been beheaded, who have been killed uh, and for the, uh, have been martyred for not denying the name of Yeshua, not denying Jesus. And so did they suffer tribulation? Yes, absolutely. Uh, were there times where Yahweh's wrath is poured out on a nation and there's a remnant that is saved throughout that? Sure, there is. They escape and they're saved. Amen. So yes, be very careful about this false idea that we are spared the tribulation period. It's not the true way of interpreting 1 Thessalonians 5.9. All right, so the first time you're going to, in Western church history, uh, the first time in Western church history, the pre-trib rapture is mentioned is the 1800s. It's never mentioned in church history prior to that, never. It is something made up. You still have to create an air that there is this distinct separate group called the church, and then you can come up with this pre-trib rapture. You can start reading into scriptures this falsehood, okay? So it's, it's very easy to dismantle this. And I pray that people will begin to take a stand on the truth and understand that we are part of Israel, all right? We are part of her covenants and we are connected to her. So there is no such thing as a pre-trib rapture. Let's be ready to be the salt of the earth. Let's be ready to go through the tribulation period together, amen? Standing arm in arm in unity as the body of Messiah, because we will be heavily persecuted as the body, but we will be purified and made white. Amen. All right. So that brings us then to the book of Revelation. Now you should easily now be able to understand, just study the word church and how it's false. It's Kyriakon, which means something that belongs to the Lord. That's actually what Kyriakon means. All right, and it's basically only mentioned twice in the Bible. It's mentioned in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, where it talks about um, uh, the day of the Lord, okay? Um, and it also is mentioned in 1 Corinthians, yeah, chapter 11, where it's talking about um, the supper of the Lord. You'll see Kyriakon used there, okay? It's something that belongs to the Lord. Now, later on, 
you know, throughout uh, the Western church history, it gets connected to a building. That's the big thing. Kyriakon, something that belongs to the Lord, gets connected to a building. But once you understand that the word ecclesia does not mean church, now all the seven assemblies there in the book of Revelation make total sense. It's not the church. It is the assembly of Messiah. Are they spared and, and raptured and taken out? No, nowhere in the book of Revelation is there a pre-trib rapture. OK, so you have this false ideology that there's something separate and distinct called the church. So you read about these seven assemblies and then you start what inferring that Revelation chapter four is the rapture of the church. OK, so once you understand that it's just assembly, it's it's congregation and it's the congregation of Messiah and that belongs to Israel, that is something inside of Israel, then you know that it's prepping you for the tribulation period. It's giving you all kinds of great information on how your assembly needs to be ready. All right, the good, the bad, and the ugly of each assembly is warnings to us that our assemblies need to stand firm. And these things all begin to happen in our assemblies and this is how we take care of them. That's why we study those seven assemblies to make sure none of that is going on you know, or at least none of the bad stuff that Yeshua points out uh, to the assemblies there. Uh, you want to be encouraged on the good things that Messiah Yeshua said to the assemblies there, all right? But in chapter four, this is where they say the rapture of the church happens. It says, after these things, starting with verse one, I looked and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard speaking with me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. Speaking to Yochanan, speaking to John, there's nothing about the church here. So people will try to say, see, there's no mention of the church after this chapter. That's because that word isn't even mentioned in the Bible pertaining to the body of Messiah in the way that it's being taught. So no. It's all about Israel and we're all part of Israel. So everything being mentioned here is about the purification of the bride, which is Israel, all right? She's being brought back. She's being purified. She's gotta go through tribulation. We're all going through it with her because we're grafted in and we're a part of her, all right? This is why you see the 144,000, all right? They are believers in Yeshua preaching the word of God. We also see here in uh, Revelation 12, Okay, the dragon is going to attack Israel. That's the woman. So right? he's going to be enraged at the woman. Okay, and off to make war with the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Yeshua. All right, he's going to be persecuting all those who are part of Israel, who are part of the woman, a part of her offspring. Okay, we are all grafted into Israel. If you are what? In Messiah, you are of Abraham's seed. Okay, and that is part of Israel. That is grafted into Israel. Okay. We are part of the promises, and the promises were made to Israel. And that's who Yeshua came from, right? He's the king of Israel. So we also have here in Revelation 14, here is the perseverance of the Kedoshim. Okay. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the perseverance of the holy ones, the Kedoshim, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua. You see, you are going through the tribulation period. Okay. The body of Messiah will go through it. We are the salt of the earth. Okay. And this is why Revelation 19 okay, speaks of the bride getting herself ready. Okay. Getting herself ready. Revelation 19 is talking about here. Let me go down here. Okay. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, verse 6, the roar of rushing waters, or like the rumbling of the powerful thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for Yahweh's uh, Elohe Zabaot reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. She was given fine linen to wear bright and clean for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the Kedoshim, the holy ones. Amen. This is going to happen when at the white throne judgment time, after everything has been done. Amen. Remember, first comes the judgment where the wicked are thrown into the lake of fire. Then comes the glorious giving of all the rewards and so forth to the righteous. And we go through the wedding feast at that time. Okay. The millennial reign is a time where people are getting saved, becoming part of the bride, getting to know Yeshua. 
All right. So the actual wedding feast happens at the end of the millennial reign. And I could talk a lot more about that. Um, I've already think I've made this teaching long enough here. I've given you solid ground on why there is no pre-trib rapture. Okay. So we need to move away from that and begin to get back to the proper understanding and study of the word of Yahweh. Okay. There's a lot of false teachings out there. And again, as I wrap this up, as I wrap this teaching up, if you are sitting under a assembly that believes in the pre-trib rapture, I'm not saying everything they're teaching is wrong, okay? But you are under a false teaching doctrine in that area, in that area. So do not hold to that, amen? Now, if you like this teaching and you want to learn more about what I teach, just go to my YouTube channel, amen? And you can hit the subscribe button there on the right-hand side. And that will take you to my YouTube channel. I have hundreds of videos there concerning the Messiah, the body, the covenants, uh, concerning the word, the Ecclesia, the, the uh, teaching that I did. I have a three-part teaching on the Ecclesia of Yeshua. And I go through in much more detail on how this word Ecclesia, all right, is not connected to the word church in the way that everyone is teaching it. All right. So I hope you've enjoyed this time, enjoyed our time together. There's much more to come. And yes, I will be. I have a, the book of Revelation there in my YouTube channel there. Uh, you can go through my teachings and hear my point of view on that. I'll be doing some more here on Ezekiel 38 and 39 and so forth. There's a lot to come. Amen. And so as the body of Messiah moves forward, let's move forward in unity together in him. Amen. Just like he wanted us to. So blessings, everyone. I love you and shalom.